my life. I wanted to be an actor and a dancer. And success meant getting cast in great roles, performing in great theaters, and becoming highly skilled at my craft. I had taught dance and playwriting in high school and college. And so when I got a job after graduating from college as a playwriting teacher for high school students in the juvenile justice system here in Washington, DC, I saw it as a great next step toward my goal. What I learned about my students when I first met them, they were 17 and 18 year olds, and I learned that most of them were reading at a third grade level and writing at a third grade level. I also learned that they loved their city of Washington, D.C., and that they were fascinated by archaeology. So I brought in an archaeologist to speak with them about his science. And the students decided to set their play in their city of Washington, D.C. in the year 3000, after the city had been destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> In Washington, D.C., and the city had been destroyed, and they made the characters in the play archaeologists who were excavating the site that had once been a place called Washington, D.C. So they excavated and they found, as you do, they found artifacts. They found this, this rectangular paper with numbers and presidents' faces on it, um, and they wondered what that might be, so they, they put it to the side for further investigation. They dug a little further, and they found this, um, these plastic bags with white powdery stuff in it that to the side. This was in 1989 at the height of the crack cocaine epidemic here in D.C. So they put that to the side. What might it be? Then they found this metal thing with um, a barrel and a trigger and what could that be? Put that to the side for investigation. And they found a journal of an 18-year-old boy who had written about his daily life. And they read through the journal and they discovered that the last few pages were gone. They had disintegrated. But on the last page they could read they saw the boy talking about his, his life and his day and saying somebody had insulted his girlfriend and he was taking the gun to go with him to settle the score. The rest of the journal was gone. So naturally, the archaeologist built a time machine to go back to the year 1989 to find out what was going on. So they went back in the time machine, and you can imagine the sets and the costumes and the music that accompanied that part of the play. They went back to Washington, D.C. in 1989, and they learned. They found out what the money was. They found out what the crack was. They learned what the gun was. And they met the boy's mother. They encountered her. She was very, very upset. She was crying. She said, I haven't seen my son in three days. So the archaeologist said, well, we'll go see if we can find him. Find him. And they went off in search of the, of the boy. The students writing the play decided to end that scene unresolved. They decided to have the archaeologist never find the boy. And this is why. They said, look, if we find him and everything's OK, it's not that easy. It doesn't really work out that way a lot of times. If we find him, he's dead, then there's no hope. And we can't possibly send that message. So they left that scene unresolved. They took the time machine back to the year 3000, and the play came to an end. But then the students engaged the audience in a conversation about what might have been able to be done back in 1989 to save Washington, D.C. And the audience was comprised of community leaders here in D.C. and also at least one family member for every student. And many family members told me afterward that this was the first time they had come to school to celebrate the young people in their family instead of because, because the kids were in trouble. It was the first time they'd come for a positive reason. So I got to learn something about the students in my class. I got to learn that they wanted to be change makers. They saw themselves, and they were, social entrepreneurs. They defined success as the ability to bring about positive change in their communities. And I strongly suspected that if they had had teachers all along who had offered them interesting and important work to do, and had allowed them to contribute and struggle with important questions and to develop their own voices, not only would they have learned to read and write much sooner, which they did in the year we spent together, they would never have found their way into the juvenile justice system. And so this experience caused me to redefine success for myself. 
I decided I wanted to be a teacher. I went to grad school, I studied teaching, and I became a sixth grade teacher in a middle school. And it was working. I was doing what I wanted to do. I was creating the kind of change I had hoped to change for the students in my classroom. We were debating, we were discussing, we were doing student-driven projects, lots of opportunities for the students to develop their own voices. My students choreographed a dance to explain their understanding of fractions and geometry. They loved, which was an amazing, an amazing thing to see. They lobbied the principal, they lobbied our principal with my support to get funding to be able to dissect frogs as part of our biology unit. And one group of students protested because they felt that this violated animal rights, so they got to design their own alternative project and do that instead. They also organized a school-wide mock presidential election. This was in 1992 when the candidates for Bill Clinton, George Bush Sr., and anybody know who the third one was? Perot. Ross Perot, that's right. So they, so they organized this election, they registered voters, they ran the school-wide election on election day, and then they tallied the results. And there was one teacher who pointed out this was not part of the curriculum. And so she told her students they couldn't vote, they couldn't participate, though some of them did anyway. And as you can imagine, that was a really important learning experience also for all the students. So I thought, all right, I found what it is I want to do. I, I love teaching. I feel I'm making a change. But after a while, it became clear that there needed to be a change in the teaching profession itself. Because even though I was very fortunate, I had support from my principal, my kids and their parents for my unusual methods, I was considered an anomaly. And the rest of my colleagues were doing something else. How many of you have seen the movie Waiting for Superman? Seen that movie out? It's out, a movie out right now, a very, very important film that is, is bringing, bringing conversations uh, nationwide about what education ought to be and what education reform is about. But it has missed a really important opportunity to define good teaching. And I'll tell you about a scene from the movie. There's a scene where there's a, it's a cartoon, and there's a teacher standing with a milk carton and uh, kids seated in front of her. And she's opening up the heads of the kids and pouring in the milk from the milk carton, and then closing their heads again. And um, and that's a good that's a good teacher. And then there's a bad teacher opening up the heads and like spilling it on the floor. Okay. So the difference, and this is what we're told, right? The difference between a good teacher and a bad teacher is that a good teacher delivers the knowledge right into the kids' heads, and a bad teacher, you know, doesn't tries but, but isn't able to. And so I thought about the other good teachers in my school, and that's what they were doing. They were delivering the information pretty well into the kids' heads. But I knew that that's not what a good teacher ought to be doing. I knew from my experience in the classroom that a good teacher should be an instigator of thought. A good teacher should ask really tough questions, should offer students problems to solve instead of spoon feeding them answers, and should engage students in authentic conversations about the relationship between freedom and responsibility instead of coercing them to behave through the threat of punishment or the promise of rewards. And I was getting to be an instigator of thought in my classroom, but I wasn't normal. I wasn't the usual teacher. And so I really decided I wanted to create a change in the teaching profession itself. And I decided to redefine success once again, and I left the classroom. And after a series of tries, in different directions. In 1995, I founded Center for Inspired Teaching. Inspired Teaching's mission is to invest in teachers to ensure that school makes the most of students' innate desire to learn. We train teachers from recruitment to retirement to be instigators of thought. And in the organization's 15-year history, we have defined and redefined success a number of times. Right now, as part of our strategy, we're preparing to open a school this coming fall that will serve as a model for how all teachers should teach and how all kids should be educated. And the school is organized around four I's. Intellect, inquiry, integrity, and imagination. And all of our teacher, pro uh, teacher training programs embrace those four I's. And that's how I believe all kids should be taught and evaluated. I'm really excited by the work that I get to do at Center for Inspired Teaching, 
by the change we've made so far and by the change, changes that are yet to come. I've also learned a lot about what it means to be a change maker, including understanding that I need to be open to changes in myself and in my role and open to redefining success over time. The, uh, the great dancer and choreographer Martha Graham, the mother of modern dance, has some words that can guide those of us who strive to be change makers. And here's what she says. You have to keep open and aware directly to the urges that motivate you. There is no satisfaction ever at any time. There is only a divine dissatisfaction a blessed unrest that keeps us marching and makes us more alive than others. My journey has taken me from actor and dancer to teacher to education reformer. Guided by Martha Graham's words and my own learning, I've learned to define success not based on the role that I play, but based on the impact that I create. So for all of us who strive to be change makers, we can learn from Martha Graham as we define and redefine success and remain divinely dissatisfied. Thank you.